Welcome back to part two of our discussion on connectivity and software. We're happy to have you here at the IAA Mobility Visionary Club. If you missed part one, go back and watch that. We are carrying on the discussion and we're getting down to brass tacks. I want to introduce you to my panel of guests. Anil, you start. Hi, Anil Harir Krishnan, Director of Product Engineering, Haman Automotive. My name, is, my name is Oliver Schwaga from BCG Platinum, the brand for tech and digital in the Boston Consulting Group. Okay, and Philip. Hey, my name is Philip Timmern. I'm leading the partnership activities for Europe for Zinc. Okay, it's great to have all of you here. Thanks for joining us again for part two. As promised, we're breaking out the tough ones this time. We've all taken our positions here on software, connectivity, what the OEMs need to do. So Philip, my first question for you, do OEMs even have the capability to build and maybe even more importantly, to curate a digital platform or an ecosystem. Can they actually do this? I mean, the automakers, specifically also the ones in Germany, also in Europe, they have been one of the most innovative companies for the past decades. And it mm. would be very sad to say if they would not be able to deliver something like that. But is it or, sad but true? No, I wouldn't say it's true, but it takes more time because it's somewhere in the culture um, that they have a culture of delivering hardware goods, or mostly mm. focused on hardware that have focus on performance, focus on safety features, but less really on consumer software. And that takes a while to adjust that. But they're still very attractive also on the, on the, on the employer market and young people like to work for them. Um, so I don't think it's, it's a big difficulty for them to solve that over time, but it takes time definitely. But do yeah. they have time? I mean, is, the, is there time to solve this? There is less time than they, are, that, uh, they, would, they would like to, like to have. Just mm -hmm. because... Um, Car companies are not car companies anymore. They want to be technology companies. And there are a lot of technology companies who want to become car companies. So this, in this rush, th there is much less time in order to deliver that software what the consumer needs. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the capability question is, uh, there's no uh, black and white, right? Um, uh, the, the, the thing is, it's uh, new skills, totally new skills that are required, right? And um, even if you would throw in the best developers from, from digital native companies uh, to build automotive software, they would fail too, right? Yeah. Because uh, there are different, uh, totally different requirements in, in terms of test and validation, for instance, and also some limitations that you just need to understand, right? But uh, on the other side, you need totally to adapt how do you build cars and you are, how to build hardware and software together. Okay. And I think this mm -hmm. is a total total change of mind that we see here, um, uh, moving away from a, a thing where you integrate every three months and you have a new development version of a vehicle to coming down to have a, a nightly build or a daily build uh, that you have in the software industry. Mm. Yeah. Right. The most innovative and connected software and appealing UI, it's all worthless unless you have stable software. We see several OEMs struggling with this. Should the industry focus on basics first? Definitely. Uh, and uh, this is also what, what we see right now, I guess, right? So people, uh, after being very bullish on uh, building up their teams and so on, uh, people go back and ask themselves, okay, what is the strategic best, uh, best setup and what can we achieve, right, in, in, in this point in time? And then also refocusing on what are the areas that we should invest to and also um, uh, put our own de developers in. What are the vital control points that we need to own? Where space for suppliers, but also for partners that we need to get them an envelope where they build uh, their solutions that can, could be part of our platform. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and this is... this. Um uh, having ownership of these absolute basics is also the trend that we currently fully see because when you own it, you have 100% control than um, the the supplier models that we that we had. So this is definitely happening. Yeah, the basics are going to get. I, I don't think it's that easy to just say let's do the basics first because yes, of course you need to fix the basics first because if you don't have the basics, basics, no software can perform well on that. But you still need to be quite fast because let's not fool ourselves. We live in a time where people actively decide not anymore to buy a car from a specific brand because the infotainment system or the infotainment unit was pretty bad yeah? mm -hmm. because it crashed and hadn't, couldn't be restarted or whatever. These decisions are already on the table today. Yeah? Exactly. So we need to fix it very, very fast. This is why we call um, uh, people don't buy, buy anymore based on RPM, based on EPM, experiences per mile. And mm. this is exactly the point. 
And basics is also a bit misleading because uh, we're also seeing a heavy, heavy invest in autonomous, right, from a software perspective, where there's the most crucial uh, point, where right? you also need to decide, are we on the right track, right, or do, do we have to change plans on overall setup? So it's not like that we can just do a bit uh, a better uh, connected fueling in, or connected charging integration and then we are done. It's really a, a long-term game here, right? But maybe... Fix the fir basic first is also relates to how good are we at the uh, this ethos of being a software driven company mm -hmm. and having the capabilities uh, to have the tool chains and the processes in place really, because this is something that you need to acquire now uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to have the payback in in some years. Yeah. I mean, in the end, there are two options, right? Either you're gonna manage and provide that, and then you are able also as an automaker to have a business model around it, to participate from these value pools, to get some IP, to get data in. Or you don't. And then, I mean, there are solutions on the table. It's not that you must do everything on your own. There's like big tech just waiting desperately to approach them and, and say, please give us your solution. Uh, give, um, let, uh, please use our solution. Yeah. And, 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 this, is, yeah. and, and, and this is, this is the value, the, that mindset that uh, the revenue generation is not going to happen majorly at the point of sale of the car, but actually during the lifetime of the, of the car. It's something like a mobile through the entire app store, mm. right? Um, and, and this uh, needs to happen in the automotive industry. And, and, and this is the paradigm shift, right? So yeah. coming from a, from a serial, uh, serial product pipeline product. into a, a really an ecosystem approach where a lot of innovation uh, happens in, 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 the, in the long tail, right? right. In, the, in the usage of the car. What is at least uh, something like eight, ten years, right? Where, where you have to invest, uh, in, invest into the vehicle and the capabilities, but you also uh, can address new revenue pools that were not there in the past. Yeah, but here the clash is what we see is going to be how do how does in such an ecosystem ecosystem is usually put everything into one basket kind of a thing, okay. right? Mm. But cars are brands, so this tussle is going to be very interesting to watch. So how does ecosystem play with brands? Right? How does a, a BMW, a Daimler, a, a GM still maintain its brand identity, but still benefiting from the ecosystem? That's going to be... And, and this is a new capability required, being a, a real curator of such a platform, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also de defining what is good for, for the brand. Uh, because it's, it's, your, it's your reputation at yeah. risk. Uh, you win, you lose, right? Yeah, I mean, so, so, so far you just said CarPlay and it's the same in, in the Bugatti as it is in the Fiat, right? I mean, is it a good thing for the Fiat driver? Yes, for the Bugatti driver, I don't know. Maybe then the driver's wondering why did I pay 200,000 euros for this car? <laughs> it's a fair point. You're coming at this from the most technical perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. How do we go about ensuring that the technology is universally applicable to different platforms and their software environment? Because that's something that you're going to have to think about going forward. So... The, um, Generally, there is this uh, topic of hardware agnostic software which is coming in, right? It's a dream, uh, definitely, uh, for most of the software developers when they, uh, when they hear such a word. But uh, we are walking towards it. And we also see this in OEM behavior uh, that uh, a, a lot of uh, supply, supply chain is clearly separated between hardware and the software piece. Um, and that, that, is, that is one way in which software is going to become much more universal, right? That um, it is not right in the right in the beginning tied so much to the hardware. It's a difficult part, especially with now AI coming in. What about accelerators? What about NPUs? Especially with you spoke about sensor fusion. I think somebody spoke about sensor fusion in, in the beginning. So when you fuse sensors, you need to know your sensors. So you are not really hardware agnostic, but you need to be hardware agnostic largely. And <clears throat> if it, this it's a way to manage complexity, right? Because correct. if it's all tailored and everything is only for one platform, uh, you go crazy. And also the, the suppliers, uh, they, they, there is no scale, right? There's so no there's economies for it, right? Yeah, but, I mean, in the end, it's the same as in any other platform, right? I mean, we've seen it on computers that there are some operating system in the end being the standard. We've seen it on, on, on mobile devices, even on smart TVs. I mean, we still see it on smart TVs, how this is evolving. Uh, my expectation is that it will be similar for cars. I mean, with some more differentiation for that. Exactly. But of course, there will be also some standardization. And we all live in the time of cloud-based services, luckily. So what you call then also hardware agnostic. I think that's also very similar in, 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 from, from this wording. Um, of course, you always need to adjust it for different systems that's working on that. Um, you can scale some parts in the back end that then are more flexible to yeah. deploy.
But this is a problem quite universally to any kind of software and not specific automotive, I would even say. And what I believe is, th this is not the first time this problem happened. Um, it has happened in the mobile industry. So even when the initial smartphones came up, um, I see this problem as how the mobile industry evolved and gaming industry came in, right? At some point in time, the mobile industry was confronted with the fact that now, is, uh, am I going to embrace the gaming industry or I am I need to take the excuse that, no, this is too performing, uh, performing, I can't do this in my small device, it's going to get heated up and so on. But we saw all mo uh, mobile providers embrace this and saw how can I even extend this? So extend this gaming experience and now we have <coughs> the seamless online gaming experience from your phone to your Xbox to back into your... But Anil, uh, one thing to keep in mind, it will not be a copycat of the phone industry, right? Because it, it's... Uh, because in, of the trust phone, point. Exactly. Yeah. In the phone industry, you have 100,000 of, the, of developers, Correct. right? Uh, from, the, from the small uh, shop, uh, two developers uh, thing, uh, to, to really at scale uh, exactly. brands. And for, for, I think, this, if you're talking ecosystem and partners that develop on, on that platform, yeah. it will be big brands and, and entrepreneurs, influencers that they are developing with the OEM together, right? And Fully. it's quite, you should be as an OEM quite selective uh, who can can join your boat. Absolutely. Right? So this is a key difference, right? We cannot replicate what is happening in the smartphone industry. So are you saying the car should not be open then in the end? Uh, it, it should not be totally open. So I would not do it because it's uh, there are certain control points that I should not give up as OEM, right? Mm. I, I mean, look at look at, uh, look at uh, uh, Apple, right? What what are they are they doing? They they limit very much what others can do, right? And uh, they are gaining on it, right? So they're the biggest biggest provider for for content in in which end industry ever, because they're always taking a thirty percent share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that is one argument. The other argument is we still have a huge trust barrier to come over, right? Take EVs. Uh, how many people uh, suffer from range anxiety, right? J just just a basic basic hurdle, uh, which which needs to be overcome. So. Um, what the mobile industry did not have, I fully agree, was the trust question. Mm. You, you did not have the trust question mm. with your mobile device. If it didn't work, okay, it didn't work. But if your car didn't work, that's a huge, huge well, problem, really, right? I mean, so the trust question uh, will lead to a fact that the ecosystems remain closed for some time. But I fully agree, it has to open up much, much more than what it is today. Let's briefly talk about over-the-air updates. Okay. What are you guys most looking forward to there? What are the pitfalls? BIOS update is not going to come. Let be, let's, let's be realistic. So over the updates sounds so sexy, right? It does. Uh, it does. <laughs> but, but even today, you can't update your BIOS uh, of your phone over the air. You need to be plugged in, right? And that has a reason for it. And such restrictions will exist with o over the air, right? So uh, updates which can happen only at the dealer will, uh, will happen. Updates which can happen only when you are at a safe place. So this will exist, but of course, from if you look at the uh, cockpit domain, right? Uh, uh, not the powertrain domain, but the cockpit domain uh, for FOTA or firmware over, over the uh, updates will be much more user friendly. But I think everything else, which is say powertrain, battery management, is going to be similar to BIOS updates. Yeah, that's exactly the point. It's also where user acceptance then is going to, right? Everything that's really in the front end and you see it and you touch it and you do it there's no acceptance that you need to go somewhere to update that. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you don't go to your to the Apple store to update your phone. I mean, that would be yeah. ridiculous, right? But if it's about safety, if it's about optimizing performance, there's still some... And ne degree. never say never. So I, I disagree that this will not happen because it must be, right? So if, if I'm on the road uh, and oh, just imagine uh, what, what we had, uh, that planes, uh, that uh, commercial airplanes had problems with their software, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they needed to be grounded for, for over one year, right? And mm -hmm. if this would happen in the automotive industry, that you have to ground uh, cars, uh, for, for re they are not allowed to drive anymore, then you need this over the update. So this is one. I think also safety-related uh, uh, technology will move on. I think over the update, why are they important? I mean, if you if you have the current hardware that is in, there's there's unexploited capabilities in that hardware. That is compute power, so just the capacity of, of that platform that is installed, but also sensors and, and capabilities that are in the car 
where they, you have not a use case at all, right? If you had a look again uh, in, in, in the phone industry, Apple started quite early on to insert a, a Giro sensor or uh, just recently then the LiDAR. Mm -hmm. And they had no real use case at that point in time. And the community of developers and, 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 and brands, they invested into ideas and brought innovation to it. Yeah. So over the update is something that is really vital to have an always fresh car and also innovation in the, in the ownership phase. Mm. And for the earlier um, delayed revenue, yeah, concept that we yeah, spoke the over the o over the air updates is going to be the key um, uh, vehicle with which this rate revenue is going to come because how is the value going to come into the car if you are not able to update the car? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, guys. So much to talk about. We could do a third episode. I'll just absolutely <laughs> put that in the producer's ear. But for now, I'm going to ask you the question we always ask at the very end. You're getting in a time machine and you're going to the year that is the most interesting for automotive software and connectivity. The most interesting to you personally. Philip, you go first. Where are you going and why? I would go to the year 2035. Okay, why? Um, because I think what needs to change is how we perceive time in a car. Mm -hmm. And in order for that to happen, we need more electrification and more autonomous driving on the road. And that would be my expectation that also following all this European Union regulations by 2035, we are a big step further along the way. Certainly going to be an interesting time. Okay, what about you? I guess I would be also quite careful, and uh, my my year would be 2027, 20, uh, just to have a look at uh, how did we now fix the basics, uh, uh, as we discussed, and uh, how the second generation of, of vehicles that we are currently uh, all working on uh, evolving, right? And what uh, problems have been solved, what is still exist, and uh, all about these predictions that we had on metaverse and whatever, uh, what it turned out to be in reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and you? I'd like to bring, bring a little bit fun here. So I would actually like, love to move uh, to 5000 BC. Because okay. I love, yeah. I was uh, not I love, expecting that. Yes. I, I, I love Indian traditional uh, scriptures. Um, and there, there are two machines which are mentioned in relatively huge detail. And one machine is a thought-based uh, machine. Uh -huh. So you think about, you want to go to somewhere and it takes you, right? And the second machine is um, um, you stand on a podium and it can sense your mood and if you're lying or not lying. So I would like to experience these two machines because they definitely they have superb software. <laughs> have been of the future. <laughs> I want to give you a special award for being the first guest to choose a time in the past. Very interesting, different perspectives, guys. Thanks for being our guests here today. And thank you for joining us on the IAA Mobility Visionary Club. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. If you're interested in the topic of mobility, be sure to check out our other videos for deep dives on autonomous driving, design, and so much more. For now, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.